Awesome. All right, so we've been in, we've been in chapter 3 of Colossians for a while. I thought we'd be getting out of that chapter, but we're not yet. Um, I actually worked on my message on Monday in chapter 4, and then I had a conversation with somebody on Wednesday, and I was like, oh, I've got to go back to chapter 3 again. So, but we're going to finish out chapter 3 today in this, all right? So, I'm going to give you the one thing, and we're going to go from there, all right? Here we go. Here it is. How I work matters. That's the one thing. How I work matters. All right, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a clip from a movie that came out a while ago, and I'm going to set this up. All right, so there's, a, there's this guy that wants to become a senator. And so, obviously, he went to college, and he had to take a number of exams. And one of the exams he was taking um, as he was getting farther and farther up the ladder or whatever, he actually had the answers fed to him in a microphone, in an th- earpiece. And his, so... Uh, Somehow, one of his teachers from college found out that he did that. And so, here the scene you're going to see is where this guy walks into the bathroom and here is this teacher. Okay, and they're going to have a conversation. All right, so watch this. Here we go. Everything all right? Yes, I'm fine. Yeah, you don't, you don't look so fine. And hurry up and come join the celebration. How long have you been hard of hearing, Sedgwick? Uh, very good, Mr. Honored. Very, very good, yeah. Well, I thought you might have known. Who was the poor mercenary who was feeding you the answers? Oh, just some graduate student gave him a couple hundred bucks and a warm meal. Trust to keep this between us. As always. I trust you will. Do you mean am I going to go out there and expose you for a liar and a cheat? I'm a teacher, Cedric. I failed you as a teacher. But I will give you one last lecture, if I may. All of us, at some point, are forced to look at ourselves in the mirror and see who we really are. And when that day comes for you, Cedric, you will be confronted with the life lived without virtue, without principle. And for that, I pity you. End of lesson. What can I say, Mr. Honored? Who gives it? Honestly, who out there gives it? About your principles and your virtues. I mean, look at you. What do you have to show for yourself? I live in the real world where people do what they need to do to get what they want. And if it's lying and it's cheating, then so be it. So I am going to go out there and I am going to win that election, Mr. Hundred, and you will see me everywhere. And I'll worry about my contribution later. Robert. Robert. Oops. That was his son, by the way. Whoops. So something has happened in our culture. 
And um, from being both uh, having my own business for a while, seeing what it's like for me to deal with employees. But there's something that is happening in our culture, and it's not good. It's not good. So we're going to look at this passage in Colossians. Because as a Christ follower, uh, we are called to a higher standard. Especially when it comes to work. And work can look like a lot of things. Not just because you have a job. But work has to do with how you do the things that you do. So we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 22. Listen to what this says. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. And then Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Okay, so, so right out off the bat... Um, It's important to understand, Paul is not condoning slavery. He's merely acknowledging the fact that in that culture, slavery was a very real part of their culture. In fact, historians believe that one-third of the population were slaves. And when we're talking about slaves, um, a lot of times they were more like household servants. Um, They weren't like slavery, like what we have experienced in this country. And a lot of times they actually became part of the family. In fact, if a woman's slave married a master or married the master's son, she was freed. And there were very strict rules for uh, Jewish people as far as how they would treat um, household servants. And every six years, they were supposed to free their slaves on the seventh year. That's kind of what they did on a normal basis. And so, but here's the thing. Once the church started, all right, once Jesus was crucified and then he rose again and then he went to be with the Father, and then the church started. Their view of slavery started to change because three things actually became very clear. Masters became slaves to God. And slaves became free in Christ. And all were equal in Christ. So all of that became a very clear part of the church and so the closest thing I I thought about okay so what's the closest thing that I could think of that Paul is writing about and it would be a relationship between employer and employee this passage and if if we take it a step even further he's talking about our work ethic he's talking about how we view work period Because God created us to work. And when we're not working, when we're not contributing, when we're not creating, then we're not operating out of the fullness of who God has made us to be. Because he made us like that. He made us to do that, all right? So so I reworked that verse a little bit, all right? So we're going to see that again. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Colossians 3, starting verse 22. Employees, obey your earthly bosses in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear for the Lord. Working 
Work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than people. And remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the boss you are serving is Christ. That's your boss. I talk about that a lot here at TNC, that, that God is our boss. Okay, we can kind of connect with that. Can't we, right? He's our boss. All right? And, and I've been on both sides of the coin here. Employee, employer. I've been on both sides of the coin. Um, uh, and, and of all the things, when I was an employer, you know what gave me my most stress? You know what it was? Employees. That's what gave me my biggest heartburn was employees. Okay, so, so I owned a print shop. And... Um, in the 80s and, and at one point I had seven employees and that and looking back on it there's too many too many um, and the print industry is filled with some really colorful colorful characters all right and so our two pressmen that we had one was 50 and the other was in his late 20s okay and they were forever forever complaining about something, right? The press isn't working the right way. It's malfunctioning. It's too cold in the press room. It's too hot in the press room. The, the cutter isn't cutting straight enough. The, it's too, we're coming in too early. We're having to stay too late. We need more help. The paper is curled. The ink isn't right. I mean, they just went on and on and on, right? And then there's the front desk help. These are the people, these are the gatekeepers, right? These are the people that the people first see, the customers see when they walk into the place, right? They are one of the most important people that you have on staff because if they get a bad vibe from the person at the front desk, you're in trouble, right? So we had this one girl that uh, was working and her boyfriend used to come in and they used to have arguments right there at the front counter, right? Right? That didn't work out real well, right? And then this, this girl, right, she accepted Jesus. She accepted Christ in my office, right? Two months later, I had to fire her. That was great. Because she kept coming in late. Like, I didn't know if you had a, she didn't, it was like she just didn't think that you had to come in on time to come to work. I don't know, right? Um, and then there was another guy who thought he was God's gift, to everyone. Do you ever work around somebody like that? Oh my gosh. This guy, he just thought that he knew so much about everything, including the printing industry, when he'd never worked in the printing industry in his life. Oh yeah. And he wanted to get paid three times the amount that the pressmen were making because he had a college degree. Well, he didn't get paid three times the amount that they were making and he didn't last long either. Um, but here's the thing. In our current culture, it seems, like, it seems like employees are becoming more and more entitled. Like when I think about the jobs that I've had, oh my gosh, I'm sounding like an old person now, aren't I? But when I think about the jobs that I've had, when I was when we were first married, the jobs that I did and the bosses that I had, I had this one guy. Okay, so I was a, I was a reconditioned specialist at a car dealership. That meant I washed the cars, okay? But my boss was a mean old codger, who was a Christian, by the way. Mean old codger, man. If, oh, baby. You know what? And I, I, but I did it because we needed the money, and I was like, it was a job. So I did the job, right? Um, and, it, you know, so, I mean, I've had lots of different kinds of jobs. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. As a Christ follower, as a Christ follower, Mark, I mean, Paul wants to make it very clear. We, we are supposed to have a higher standard for our work. We are to take our work seriously. Because we're not working for a person. 
we're actually working for God. In whatever it else, in whatever we do, it doesn't matter if you're an employee or you're a volunteer. It doesn't matter. Like Paul is making it very clear. And so he's saying, like in those first couple of verses, he's saying this. Number one, number one, we're supposed to work hard no matter who's watching. No matter who's watching, we're supposed to work hard no matter who's watching. If your boss is there or he's not, you're supposed to work hard. And I'll tell you what, like when I was working for the print shop before I owned it, my boss, I don't know why, but every time when I screwed up, he was right there. He was right there. We, I, was, I was a pressman at the time, so I was running this big job for Calphalon Cookware. And it was a 10,000 flyer run, right? So I was just finishing up 10,000 flyers. Beautiful, right? The stack is this high. Just finishing up. 952, 53, 54. My boss comes up, looks at the stack, and he goes, weren't those supposed to be on yellow paper? Whoops. <laughs> right? But I was like, you're right. So, so I called up Calphalon Cookware and said, is it okay if these are on? I don't even know what color, blue. They're like, oh, it's fine. We don't care. Whew, dodged a bullet there. <laughs> but, you know, the, the key is, is that we're supposed to work hard no matter who's watching. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because we're not working for the boss. We're working for God. Right? The other thing is, is to remember who you're working for. Remember who you're working for. I can, I, I, I can take it all the way down to God. I can take from your boss all the way down. If I look at your boss, he was born to somebody else and he was born to somebody else and somebody else and, and obviously that's via God's hand and then I can talk to you about, I don't care what kind of manufacturing you're in, you're actually using stuff that is from the earth that God created, right? I mean, I can take it all the way back and, and, and just let you know, you're ultimately working for God. That's who you're working for in your environment, okay? All right, and then verse 25. He says, but if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. Okay, so third principle here is being a Christ follower does not cover up your shabby work. And don't think that you're going to get out of it because you know Jesus if you do shabby work. Okay, so there was a book that came out years ago in 1981 called Addicted to Mediocrity. Okay, this book was written by a guy named Frankie Schaefer. Okay, Frankie Schaefer was the son of Francis Schaefer who was a very well-known Christian philosopher. Um, he wrote books on genocide and he wrote books on infanticide and a book called How Should We Then Live about all these things that were just starting to take place. Very smart guy. Well, his son, Frankie Schaefer, was a movie director. Christ follower, but he wrote this book on the mediocrity that he saw in the arts with Christians. And I don't know if you've ever seen any movie, Christian movies from the 80s. I, I would say if you want to get a good laugh, watch some of those movies. They are cheesy with a capital C. Horrible. Right? And it creeped into the church. Right, this mediocrity stuff. So let's listen to what he writes. He says, imagine you wish to build a home and for one reason or another you seek out for yourself a Christian builder. Okay? I'm not sure what you mean by a Christian builder. Um, are the bricks he uses Christian? Does he have Bible verses scribbled on them? Perhaps he employs seminary students at slave wages, but for whatever reason you have decided he is a Christian builder. You employ him, hoping to get a decently constructed house as a result. 
you move into your house some months later or years later, and on the first night of your occupancy, as the rain pours down, torrents of rain, of water, come through the roof. The refrigerator falls into the basement. The stairs collapse as your wife climbs them. Your children receive electric shocks in the shower. And so you pick up the phone and, if it's still working, call your Christian builder and have some strong words with him. If all he could offer were some spiritual platitudes, perhaps humming a bar from the latest Christian hymn, quoting a few Bible verses for comfort and telling you that you are being tested, this is really good for you and you should give thanks in all things. If this was all that he gave you, you're going to have a different perspective on people who say they're Christians but do shabby work. Right? That's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, as a Christ follower, we should be the best employees that an employer has. And I'm telling you from somebody that had some pretty mean bosses, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're not working for him. You're working for God. And God notices. He notices how we work, right? He notices, okay? So, we, sh we should have the reputation of being diligent and loyal and punctual and responsible. Um, when Paul was writing another letter to some Christians in Ephesus, he was addressing an issue that was happening in the church where people wanted something for nothing. Does that sound familiar? Some had decided that stealing was better than working and they refused to work and that was creating a huge burden on the church and on the community. Our culture is buying into some of that and it has created a huge burden on our community. Okay? Listen to what he says. Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 28, if you are a thief, Paul doesn't mention any words, he just goes right to it. If you are a thief, quit, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others. Because we were made to work hard. Okay? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of stinking work. Right? Renovating a house is a lot of stinking work. And I'm telling you, there were times when I was like, oh my gosh, I can't die, I'm done, oh my word. But you just keep going. And you get it done. Right? And then Paul wrote another letter to another church where they were having issues with this. So this has been going on for a long time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, listen to what he wrote. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live and you will not need to depend on others. Do you know that a really good way for you to witness for Jesus is to be a really good employee? Because I'm telling you, as a former business owner, finding a good employee is like a diamond in the rough. I'm telling you. Anybody that has worked in a business or been over people, I'm telling you, you have good people that work for you, it is like a oh, breath of fresh air. And, and it's amazing that it actually makes an impact. It makes an impact, right? And then Paul moves to the bosses. Okay, so we talked about employees. Now we're going to move to the bosses. Here we go. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Bosses, be just and fair to your employees. Remember that you have a boss in heaven. 
Okay? If you're a boss, if you ever run a, repar- a department, you're um, in charge of a group of volunteers, whatever it is, right? Right? As a Christ follower, you're called to be just and fair. We're, we're called to be just and fair as a boss, as somebody that's leading a group, right? Why? Why are we, why are we supposed to do that? Why are we supposed to do that? Because he says, remember, you have a boss in heaven, right? You are... He, I mean, Paul makes it very clear. There's, there is never going to be a Christ follower that gets to the point where they're not accountable to God. Ever. Ever. I don't care how far up you go up the ladder, you are going to be accountable to God. Right? If the President of the United States is a Christ follower, he's accountable towards God. Period. Right? It doesn't matter. You are always going to be and have a boss. And how we treat those that work for us or under us or volunteer for us matters. It matters. So when we, when we started this, down in, this, in just chapter 3, when we started this thing about this, I, I asked you a question and I asked you how you were going to fill in a blank. Okay? Like, Let's, let's go to the next one there, uh, buddy. Okay, I said, blank is my life. And I, and I said, how are you going to fill in that phrase? Because all of us are born like this. Blank is my life. That's how we're born, right? We're born with a blank, okay? And then throughout our lives, we try to fill that blank with different things or we form our identity through different things as we live our lives, like people, hobbies, interests, obsessions, ideologies, experiences, fill that blank, right? Sometimes it's dangerous and destructive that we fill the blank with, right? Right? Partying, drinking, drugs, sex, whatever it is, right? We, we, we get destructive, filling that blank, right? Um, And then sometimes there's this casual stuff that we do that turn into an obsession, like eating, sports, hobbies, politics. All of a sudden it becomes an obsession, right? And and that starts to define our blank, right? Um, Or sometimes there's normal pursuits, like my family, um, my spouse, my ministry, my career, what, whatever I place in the blank, whatever that is, starts to can define me and then dominate me and then determine my thoughts and actions. Right? And so we, we talked about, like, are we letting Jesus, Jesus fill us with his message? Remember what his message is? Forgiveness and mercy and grace and salvation and love. That's his message. Are we filling that spot with his message, right? And then last week we talked about are we letting Jesus fill our family relationships? Are we letting him fill our family relationships? And it doesn't matter if you're, if you're single, married, or single again. It, it doesn't matter. Are we letting Jesus fill... And then today we talked about letting Jesus fill our work and how we work. Because this is all a part of filling that blank in us. What is that? How are we going to let Jesus fill that? How are we going to let Jesus fill our life in those different parts because as far as God's concerned there's no separation there's there's no separation everything we do has this connection between us and God everything right okay we're going to sing this last song and then I'm going to close this all right so let's